Thank you very much for the introduction. Sorry. Um, my name's Paul Maruff, as, as Professor Donnan said. Uh, I'm a neuropsychologist by training. I'm appointed here at the Flory. I'm also an employee of Cogstate, so I have some conflicts here. However, I'm not going to be talking about Cogstate tonight, so you don't have to buy anything from the table outside. I think it's important... Am I just getting a little bit of... Important to uh, just to consider for a moment three, three people uh, uh, where we're sitting in the town and in the place. The first, I just have to get these right, on my right is Howard Florey, who, uh, uh, after who this institute is named, actually didn't discover penicillin. Fleming discovered it. Florey commercialised it. And apparently it was a cantankerous old bugger. And, uh, uh, but despite that, possibly the, what the Australian that's contributed most to the human health, uh, to human health. Speaking of cantankerous old buggers is my boss, Colin Masters, who sits in the middle, who largely was responsible as a, as a young scientist for isolating the amyloid protein, which we still are pursuing and what you're going to hear about tonight. Uh, and he's been a great uh, help. Uh, and despite the fact that for many years I was absolutely scared witless of him, uh, he's turned out to be a good friend. And on to the left here is a guy called Alan Wade, uh, a friend of mine too, who, who was the subject of my PhD, uh, a general practitioner from Pakenham, who now it turns out probably had a pre senilin mutation and developed dementia very early while in, in his 50s. Uh, and I spent pretty much six years with Alan as I watched him go from uh, a, 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 an engaged, alert person into dementia and ultimately stood there with his brain in my hands. And I think a crucial point part about uh, this adventure, this journey that we're on, is the importance and the humanity of, of what it is that we're seeking to do. And I, and I really try all the time never to forget that. These are his drawings, in fact, and I think they illustrate quite nicely the degeneration that occurs as someone loses their ability to make decisions, to plan and to remember. Uh, this this uh, clock, if you like, is, a, is a, a response to a command of mine where I might say to someone, draw for me a clock and make the time on that clock uh, 10 past 2. And despite it being a very simple uh, sort of command, you can see that as the disease... Um, uh, uh, deteriorate, uh, as the disease progresses, the deterioration is quite substantial. Um, we all probably know people with Alzheimer's disease and you know the characteristic presentation of it is a loss of memory and a loss of ability to make plans, a loss of orientation in time and place. We know it is a disease that steals very much the personality and the ability of individuals to interact with their families. We know too that it's going to be a, a population emergency in a sense in that given that the greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is age and as we all know, had these statistics probably rammed down our throats many times, is that as our average age is increasing, so too is the prevalence of the disease. Now, these data here are from the uh, American Alzheimer's Disease Association published last year and they sort of give us the most up to date. Largely it's the um, the, the proportion of people um, aged over 65 uh, who meet a clinical criteria for Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that 85 and above, it's about 60% of the population. Um, you can see too that the prevalence or the proportion increases as a function of the decade. And it's instructive that this data is broken down by something that's not quite relevant to Australians but largely to Americans more so by the presence of, uh, of, of, of race, African American, Hispanic or Caucasian. And do you notice that the rate of, of dementia is lower in the Caucasians as a function of age group? It makes you think something about race or maybe about the circumstances within which those people live. So that's dementia. Remember that it, what I'm going to talk about tonight is the idea of Alzheimer's disease and as our, as our research has sort of really accelerated in all directions there's a funny sort of schism that's occurred and that is that when I was training we would call Alzheimer's disease a clinical diagnosis where we would seek to determine what people could and couldn't do and then look for clues as to what or what not might, might, what might not be causing it and we would call that Alzheimer's disease and that largely sort of comes up with this idea that that's a dementia. 
Dementia is, a, 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 is just a clinical term for a description of a person that has substantial impairments in thinking, substantial impairments in cognition, such that it interferes with their ability to live independently. That's largely the, the definition of, of dementia. So you have dementia and you have Alzheimer's disease. And now as we're starting to understand the biology of Alzheimer's disease, we actually now come up with another thing where we say you have dementia and you have the biological evidence of Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is the biology, the dementia is the clinical presentation. Okay? So when you see statistics like this, you, you'll talk about people with dementia, but this might not be all, or those dementias might not all be due to Alzheimer's disease, they might be due to other things. Uh, and in that context, it's interesting is that we're starting to understand about population health. Uh, and to some extent, there has been identified risk factors that are in middle age that might contribute to dementia in older age. And these risk factors here have been shown to be risks for Alzheimer's disease that are potentially modifiable. To the extent that if we could get onto those as pub public health uh, 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 endeavours, might we be able to reduce the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease? Now, you can see those are probably the things that every one of you has been told not to do by your doctors in every circumstance. But certainly it's the case. And even to the extent in the generations that we're seeing now of an age of 65 and above, the actual prevalence of Alzheimer's disease or the dementia is actually decreasing a little with the hypothesis that probably smoking that the people who are 60 and 70 now were of that generation where anti-smoking and healthy eating started to become important <coughs> and that is starting to reverberate through now. So we have other risk factors that we think we could, um, and I'll come back to that as, as, as we proceed through the um, talk. When you look at the brain of a person who has died with Alzheimer's disease, died with a dementia of the Alzheimer type, you notice that there's much less of it than there is a healthy brain. You can see the spaces between, the spaces that sort of in the ridges, the sulci of the brain are much greater. There's less material there. If we come in with a microscope now, cut the brain open and look with microscopes and look to see what it is about those brains. You see these characteristic um, uh, um, pathological uh, signals or signs that you see. The top is a picture of an amyloid plaque, the yellow is an amyloid plaque. It's been stained but with a stain so that it appears yellow under a microscope and around it stained black are uh, things called neurofibrillary tangles. These two th aspects of pathology of the disease are both indicative of the disease or pathognomonic of the disease, how we diagnose the disease, and are the main biological target by which we're seeking to stop the disease. So this is, these are the things in the brain that we think are causing the disease, although to tell the honest truth, we're not quite sure exactly how they do, but certainly it's the case that these are involved. If you look under the microscope in great detail, on my right there are uh, amyloid plaques stained, and on the left you can see the sort of triangular shape of the neurofibrillary tangles. Amyloid plaques, fibrillary tangles, or in the 21st century called amyloid and tau. And different people believe that these different parts of biology cause the disease. The uh, A-beta, or the Baptists as they call, and the Taoists, the two competing views of Alzheimer's disease. And of course you know what's going to be the answer probably in the long run, uh, it's both. However, um, it, it's certainly the case that if you meet people or see people who have predominantly just tau in their brain, typically you don't see dementia. So it's, well tau is probably a necessary condition, it's not sufficient for dementia, and so our focus is certainly moved or has continually been on the amyloid part. And here's a cartoon, if you like, that sort of shows the processes by which the amyloid breaks down. 
and starts to form those plaques. There's a precursor protein called the amyloid precursor protein, which is a glycoprotein that sort of is half inside and half outside the cell wall. And then by some process is that receptor broken or cleaved and a protein fragment is set free, a protein fragment that doesn't occur normally in biology, and it's that when it gets set free, starts to aggregate and accumulate with other protein fragments and give rise to the, these plaques. And the process by which that occurs, we're not quite sure what turns it on or what specific. So you, you, you may have heard of head injury or a gene, but there's a number of different pathways by which that amyloid precursor protein might be cleaved to give rise to the amyloid fragment. Um, down the bottom is a, a cartoon from uh, Scientific American that I think shows it nicely. On the left, the uh, amyloid precursor protein, the, the purpley half circle there is indicative of a cell wall and you can see the receptor sticking in and outside the wall with the curly end. You can see the amyloid bit cleaved, the, the, the big curly bit of the receptor broken and the A4 fragment set free, or the A, the A beta fragment set free. And then in this you can see the other accumulating with other, other fragments to give rise to the clue. I'm going to try something now that's a little dangerous. They tell us at presentation school never work with small children or animals or videos. But let's see how we go. I, I saw this uh, at Pfizer and so I thought it might be useful to show you. Have we got it? Let's start it again. So this is a scanning electron microscope reconstruction of a set of capillaries, the red are capillaries. The blue and the uh, yellowy things are amyloid plaques. So this is reconstructed from electron microscopy to give you a sense of what amyloid plaques look like when they're in, enmeshed inside blood vessels inside the human brain. The important part of this, I'll, I'll do it again, is that you can see that these amyloid plaques form around capillaries. They sort of clump around them. Can you see that? Are they either yellow or can't give it. So that's what, a, what we imagine, or at least reconstruct, uh, a human brain with pieces of amyloid all the way through it, all gunked up, for use of a technical term. So. It's these things then that we can see by microscope when we uh, at autopsy and look through a brain and stain them. And this is how they're... So the current hypothesis for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease will be to get these things out somehow to try and stop, try and either stop them aggregating to begin with or if they've aggregated, get them out. Okay, that was, wasn't too bad. We have... We have other clues uh, for, for Alzheimer's disease too. We know that different genes, not many of them, but we know that different genes increase our risk for dementia or increase the risk of people for dementia and increase the risk of people, uh, increase the risk of dementia of the Alzheimer type. This is a figure that essentially suggests the risk of Alzheimer's disease uh, on the y-axis there, and you can see very low risk to very high risk at the top, and the frequency in the population at which these genes occur. And so you can see up in the top left-hand corner there is these genes that were so bold as to suggest that these genes cause Alzheimer's disease have a very high, you carry this gene, you'll get Alzheimer's disease. But you can see that the frequency in the population of these genes is very rare. These are the genes called the presenilin genes, and um, largely less than 1% of people who have clinically recognised Alzheimer's disease will carry one of these genes. Uh, the, the, the name for this condition is changing. It used to be called autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, or dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease. Now, the characteristic presentation of this disease is a young onset. So this is my good friend Alan Wade, the general practitioner from Pakenham, probably carried one of these genes. We just didn't know it at the time. However, now we can 
we can identify these genes in people and of course they run in families and we have now large international studies trying to get groups of these people together so that we can study them. A very young onset provides us with a very important opportunity and we get to see the effects of the disease independent of the effects of age. The next important gene is this ApoE4, apolipoprotein 4, and you can see that it's relatively rare and it confers medium risk for the disease. These, by, by identifying those sorts of genes, and giving, it gives us a handle into maybe trying to find those people who might ultimately go on to develop the disease that we could study them. And second, if we can start to understand the processes by which that gene causes the amyloid accumulation, we might be able to interfere with that process as well. This is just again coming back to that cartoon of the idea of the amyloid uh, protein or protein fragment breaking free of its ap uh, um, amyloid precursor protein, clumping up into these uh, oligomers and fibrils to form these protein um, signatures. And if you look at the prevalence of AD again, now that same data I showed you before from the American Alzheimer Association just popped a different way here. Uh, age on the x-axis and the prevalence. So you can see the prevalence is quite low at 60 to 70, but essentially we're saying by the time of 90 or 80, 50 or 60 percent of people will have those um, that those, those pro that, um, will have dementia of the Alzheimer's type. If you look at the, if you look at, if you take people who are healthy, and it's probably the wrong word here, cognitively normal, say so, people without dementia, and they and people who die, and then you look in their brains, you actually find that the prevalence of these plaques also increases at a rate similar to what we see the prevalence of the clinical syndrome. Right, so someone who's cognitively normal, not demented, who dies, we look at the brain, we see those plaques and tangles, despite the fact that they haven't any uh, cognitive impairment, which led to an old problem, which was if these amyloid plaques and these tau tangles were causative of the disease, how is it that some people die with these but are not demented? And, so this is, and this has always been the great challenge to the, what's called the amyloid hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease. If it causes the disease, how can you have it and not be demented? That difference, if you think about it, is about 20 years, if, if you look at, if you just take it. So one hypothesis might be that it takes 20 years from the time you start to get this biological signal to when you start to have cognitive impairment sufficient that you're having trouble um, knowing where you are or living independently. I'll come back to that. Another important part of it is if we, this is called a meta, results of a meta-analysis. And essentially one of the problems with autopsy studies, as you can imagine, is first you need to implore people to donate their brains to you after they die. And then not many people do, so the sample sizes are quite small. And then the problem is that you really need to understand what the person's mental state was as close as you possibly can to the moment that they died. And you can imagine that that's quite tricky. So t quite often the time between a clinical examination and death can be up to two years. So one possible uh, objection to the idea that people die with amyloid plaques without dementia is that when I measured them, they were well, then they got sick and died. And what we're seeing is not the true relationship between the biology and the clinical presentation, but rather a time lag consequence. So it's always been a great problem. So one way to get around those problems is to just grab every piece of information that there is in the clinical or the scientific literature and aggregate it and see if we can improve. And here's some studies that have sort of done that. This is really just a study that's sort of gathered them all up. The size of the circles give you a relative idea of how many data points are in there, and the line just shows you that that relationship between the number, of the prevalence of these amyloid plaques and age sort of increases in that curvy linear function that I showed you before. 
So that's largely, again, showing you data that I've just showed you from a different perspective. But interestingly, on, on my left, you can see the, uh, if you break that down by those people who have cognitive impairment and those people who don't have cognitive impairment, you see that the rate is the same, but the number is different. Right? So there's still a disjuncture between the presence of the biology and the presence of the, of the clinical impairment. So that sort of sets up the act one, if you like, of the play. This, we've got this, this uh, disconnect between the biology and the clinical presentation. We've got a problem with actually finding the biology and working with it because we need to wait for people to die and for them to donate our brain so that we can seek to understand that. And we've got a very slow process. And at the same time, we've got a population that's ageing such that the prevalence of the disease is, is increasing. So you'll excuse my hubris here, but our group was one of the first groups in the world to actually develop what's called a biomarker for, al for amyloid. And a biomarker for amyloid is something that we can use to identify the presence of amyloid in the brain in people who are alive. And you can imagine the benefits of that. Uh, that we can actually detect amyloid in the brain and we can measure the person's mental status at exactly the same time so that we can understand better the relationship between the biology and the clinical presentation. Not just that, we can send them home and then say, would you come back in a couple of months or in a year so that we can measure you again? Right? It makes things... Uh, and and uh, it's highly like... I expect that there's probably people here sitting in the, in the audience who have actually had this procedure. The procedure is called positron emission tomography, which is an old technique that's used in medicine where you actually attach a radioisotope to something that has biological, um, a, a biological uh, signal. And in this case, we attach a radioisotope to a dye that binds to amyloid. And you give it intravenously, and then you put the person in a scanner up there, which will detect the, the sort of distribution of the radioactivity, with the hypothesis being that that radioactivity that doesn't bind to amyloid will be cleared, and all that will be left will be the dye that binds to amyloid, now radioactive, sufficient that we can detect it. And when we detect it, it looks like this, like heat, heat maps. And you can see here a picture of a brain. Uh, the top is looking top, so the, the, the top row of brains looking top down and the, the bottom here side on, right, facing this way, looking from the top. And the hotter the colour, the more amyloid is in there, the more radioactivity that's bound to those amyloids. So we don't know it's the case for sure, but if you cast your mind back to that um, three-dimensional movie I showed you of the amyloid plaques around the capillaries. This is what we believe these co the colours are reflecting the binding of the radioactivity to those clumps, right? With the hypothesis that the more of those there are, the worse it is. Or the more of those there are, the more advanced the biology of the disease has occurred. And if you look at someone who's an older person but well, cognitively normal, you can see that there's very little binding. And AD here stands for Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease here means a clinical presentation of dementia. And you can see the colours there much, much hotter. Right? So what you can see is the difference between someone with dementia and someone without. And maybe here a basis of a signal first of all, by which we can start to understand the genesis of the disease in healthy people, and maybe even a diagnostic tool where we can say if someone has got this, uh, maybe these are people whom will develop or do have uh, dementia of the Alzheimer's type. So, we madly, with that, started scanning anyone who would walk into the anyone who walk into our university, into our hospitals, we'll grab them and scan them. We've all had scans as fast as we can. Because what we wanted to understand was what the, 
what the distribution, what, how likely it was that different people would have this amyloid. And on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, my left here is a figure from one of our publications that shows us. I'll just walk you through it. HC, I think a misnomer, let's call it cognitively normal. And cognitively normal because we submitted people to a barrage of thinking and remembering tests and they largely perform normally. Okay, so they're normal people. In the middle, uh, on, on, sorry, on the right, in re uh, on, my <laughs> on my left in red, uh, is, is al people with Alzheimer's disease. Again, people who've met clinical criteria for dementia. Right, and you can see. And in the middle, uh, a group of people who meet a, a, a clinical criteria for something in between. And the something in between is called mild cognitive impairment, which is really just a term that we use to describe uh, people who, who have memory problems or problems of thinking that we can detect clinically, but for whom there's no problems with their independent activities of daily living. Right, so there's memory problems, and it has been in the past one of our major risk factors for dementia was that we would find an older person who had cognitive impairment. We thought, oh my goodness, this is the early stage. Right? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, the, the dotted line at the bottom, 1.5, is, is a statistical criterion that we've developed which essentially says we believe that's the normal level uh, the upper limit of normal that should be for this, for this um, binding to occur in, in, in human brains. And you can see that the majority of healthy people, in, in, of cognitively normal people, have uh, a, a substantial proportion of them have amyloid levels below 1.5. But if you compare to the Alzheimer's disease group, you can see of the red, the majority of them have, have amyloid above 1.5. And of course, we ended up with this other conundrum as well, much like has been seen in the pathology studies of people who are cognitively normal but have high amyloid. Right? So in the past, this has been the barbecue stopper on the idea that amyloid causes Alzheimer's disease because here's a bunch of people who have submitted themselves to extensive testing and have proven to be normal but still have high levels of amyloid. Interestingly, there is one person in the Alzheimer group who, as we submitted them to all of our clinical wealth, and, and we said, no, this is Alzheimer's disease, but you can see that their uh, amyloid level was in the normal range. Okay? And then, as you might imagine, this group in the middle is sort of halfway between the two. Okay, so that was very important for us, and that allowed us really then to say, so despite the fact that we can leave people's brains inside them, it's still a pretty invasive and expensive technique to get someone to come into a, a brain scanner, have this, have this amyloid imaging, undergo all the cognitive tests. It takes about half a day to go through. So it's a slope, and we can only do one person at a time. But we know that in order to understand this disease as best we can, we need to have as big a group as possible. So we were able to form this consortium of both academic, hospitals, businesses, all collaborated in basically putting money and expertise and people to try and drive this further forward. So if we've got a hint that we've got a biomarker, let's see if we can't really exploit that at the moment. And indeed, one of the PET cameras that's come from this, so PET positron emission tomography, one of the cameras that takes photographs of, the, of that amyloid in the brain actually just sits outside this room. Uh, there, which was bought with, with some of the proceeds of these things. So our progress to date is we've scanned now nearly 2,000 people of different levels of, of cognitive impairment and we've followed now to about 108 months. So we're going for nine years in some people where we've been following them every 18 months. Every 18 months, another batch of cognitive tests, another scan. And at the same time too, we're taking blood, we're taking saliva, we're doing our darndest to find every little biological signal that we can that might help us understand something about the way in which this disease develops. Another way of, of showing the data is this is a bit, a bit askew, but for example, we now have 800 people who we have data for over three years. Right? And we have 
400 people for whom we have data over 7.5 years. This is really important because now we've got good, strong information, not just about cross-sectionally, not just saying who's got it and who hasn't, but also what happens to them, who's got it and what happens in advance. So, you'll have seen this slide before, the clinical prevalence, so the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease diagnosed by doctors, and I showed you two, the prevalence of the amyloid plaques identified by autopsy. If we superimpose the prevalence of amyloid positivity detected from PET, you see it sits right on top of what we've got from the, uh, from the um, post-mortem studies. So we believe that this technology is essentially giving us the same precision as what post-mortem work does and also um, uh, a crucial part of it is it's probably giving us 20 years head start. All right? So what a great window of opportunity that is. If we can actually find this with 20 years to do something, then we have an enormous opportunity to intervene. So we can show you what happens to this amyloid as it goes across time. So this figure behind you shows healthy people, or cognitively normal, mild cognitive impairment, so they were the middle group, and people with Alzheimer's disease, what's happening to the level of amyloid in them over three years? So the first thing you might say, it actually doesn't look like much is happening, does it really? The, uh, the rate at which it's changing is very, very slow. Right? So Alzheimer's disease is a slow disease. Um, you can see what's happening to people's uh, volumes of their brain. So up in the, oh, let's, let's, let's look down the bottom here, the bottom, the bottom left is the whole brain. So we just take a measurement of the whole brain volume from magnetic resonance imaging and you can see that those people who have got dementia, um, who are amyloid positive are decreasing so they're losing brain volume. Right? And you can see the amyloid positive people here given in red, uh, even in healthy controls or here normal controls, are starting to lose it a little as well. And if we look at memory or, or aspects of thinking, th these are just different data. I'm so sorry for showing you the same data cut up different ways, but uh, at the bottom here, the blue, the blue uh, line shows you performance on a memory test, a verbal memory test. So I read you a list of words and get you to repeat them back to me. And you can see that people with Alzheimer's disease who have this amyloid positivity, the, the slope at which they're losing words across time. You can see the yellow bar, the yellow line rather, the slope at which people with mild cognitive impairment who also have this amyloid in their brain, you can see that they're losing words, but they start much higher to start with, so they're not as impaired to begin with, but they're losing words at the same rate. And you, if you look at the orange line at the top, these are the cognitively normal people who have got high levels of amyloid. So you can see that, that those people too are losing words. But interestingly, despite over three years, where they end up, they're still really within the normal range. So on this, on this um, scale here, a score of about minus two would put you in the abnormal range. Right? So if you were to do this test and come in and you scored minus two, we would say there is a memory problem. Anything less than that, we'd say there's no memory problem. So you can see our healthy, cognitively normal people, our orange people with high amyloid are deteriorating but very, very subtly. Enough for us to detect from repeated observations over time, but not enough for us to detect on any single assessment. So it comes back, I think it tells us an important aspect, which is Alzheimer's disease is a disease of time. It's got time in the denominator, so we have to understand it in the context of time. So we're able to develop a model of what this might look like. So this is a, this is a, a model truly developed from our data from the basis of just analysing those repeated observations over time. And I'm sorry for the complexity in it, but I'll just take you through it. 
You can see in red a 1.4 criterion. So that now is the criterion that we would say if we were to give you a scan and have an amount of amyloid, it's sort of a bit of an arbitrary number, but the amount of amyloid, the ratio of amyloid was 1.4, we would say that is abnormal. In these, this person, the disease has begun, despite you being cognitively normal or, or, or having some problems to begin with. Right? So the amyloid has got to an abnormal level. After it gets to an abnormal level, the red line is the average amount of amyloid that we see in people with dementia. Right, so if you take people who meet clinical criteria for dementia, measure the amyloid in them using this positron emission tomography, and then take the average of it, you can see, see that red bar there, MCI, it's about 2.2. It's a little imprecise, I know, but we're just using it as a guide. So if you take those two benchmarks, or those two marks as bookends, right? the time from 1.4 to Alzheimer's disease is about 30, uh, 20 years. There's that, that value again, 20 years. And in fact, we're even now working, trying to come back earlier than that if we can. I won't talk about that as well. But we've got 20 years. Now, in that 20 years, this is the time over which you don't meet clinical criteria for dementia. There may be some small memory impairment, no? but you don't meet clinical. And the, remember, the, the characteristic of people with dementia is they lose their ability to live independently. So to some extent, we've got that 20 years. If we can stop it, even a little bit of cognitive impairment will allow a person to stay in their home. A lot of people have small amounts of cognitive. Collingwood supporters, for example, live very well with that. OK, so this is the great opportunity that we have. These technologies, these biomarker technologies, and they're getting better and better all the time. Cheaper, less invasive, right? We are able to see the disease early on, and we're able to predict those people who are going to go on to develop the disease. And it also, too, has caused us to rethink the way in which we model uh, the, our conceptualization of Alzheimer's disease. It's not something that you just wake up with one morning. Right? I don't know if you get a feel from what I've been saying, but it's actually a disease that's very slow and develops over many, many, many years. Right? And so the idea here is that We've got the dementia at the end, but the process begins 20, 30 years before the dementia, and there's a very slow decline that probably starts to speed up as you move to the end. But this gives us an incredible opportunity to get in there uh, and intervene, okay? In the spirit of uh, working with small children and movies, I I'm gonna show you a, a movie that really shows you a model of how this amyloid aggregates prior to the onset of disease. So what you're seeing is a human brain. Uh, 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 left, left side is looking from the outside, and there's the brain cut in the middle. Okay? So looking at the inside part of the brain and the external part of the brain. And what you're looking at here is uh, the level of amyloid that you see. With the hotter the colour, the more the amyloid there is. Sorry. I'll I'll go back and do that one again. Okay. So, as you can see at the bottom there, 20 years, 19 years before the onset of dementia, 16 years, and now you can start to see the level of amyloid just increasing all very subtly, and you can see those regions at where it's increasing. So, if we get to, say, two years prior to the onset of dementia. You can see the yellow bit up on the, uh, the top towards the back of the brain there and starting to get hot, if you like, in the front part of the brain. Oops, it's gone. So this one is the same data, but now what we're doing is looking at the loss of volume. So our hypothesis is that as this amyloid aggregates, neurons start to die. And when we look macroscopically, that's manifest as a shrinking of the brain. There's loss of neurons. And you can see three years to dementia, you can see where the neurons are starting to be lost. So now it's getting colder and colder, more and more are being lost. 
And then as you progress into the dementia, you can see that the, the loss starts to occur all the way across the brain. Right? So the hypothesis here is that the, um, the amyloid starts to build up in the cortex and radiates out from there. At the same time, there's a loss of volume that starts in very specific um, areas that, as you would imagine, are associated with memory and then starts to envelop the whole cortex as we go. I talked a little bit before that there were different genetic risk factors for the disease. And I talked about APOE4. Um, if we redo our model on looking at the rate at which amyloid accumulates in people, and we split that now by those people who carry at least one allele of APOE4 and compare it to those who don't. So about 15% of the population will carry APOE4. You can see that the, that the um, APOE4 accumulation is about, gives you about a 17 year advance. So the process is sped up in those people who carry APOE4 by about 17 years. So this makes this group of people very valuable and of course something that, uh, uh, and to some extent now there are groups of, uh, of uh, people who have begun actually treating those folks who carry APOE4 irrespective of whether they have uh, meet a clinical criteria for dementia or not. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so the argument I'm making to you so far is that amyloid appears to be the bad guy here. Certainly its presence and its level is associated with a change in clinical symptomatology and the rate at which it accumulates is indicative of an individual losing brain volume and losing cognition, losing their ability to think. Right? So that's the logic that we've got so far. So the idea for treatment then is to stop that somehow. Right? You could stop it either by preventing it, aggregate to begin with. You could make it inert in a way, so try and lock it up once it was there. So envelop it with something that stops it being toxic. Or alternatively, you could try and drag it out once it was again. So that's just the three main modalities in which we are seeking to sort of try and stop amyloid uh, accumulating. And that's indicated by this slide. Okay, so we've had a couple of goes at this hypothesis. I've called this strike one, a, a drug called bapinuzumab, which was uh, studied in a very, very large group of people. And on this instrument, the ADAS-COG is a clinical instrument. Don't worry too much about what it is, but just think of it as a measure of the severity of disease with the value getting larger, the disease getting more severe. And on the x-axis here is the number of weeks. So these people are treated on bapinuzumab or placebo, measured every couple of weeks or every, every couple of months rather on the ADAS-COG and you can see two things, a large group of people, so the trials are well powered, no, no effect of the drug. So the first drug really that was aimed at testing the hypothesis that interfering with amyloid, in this case by binding it up, making it inert, could it stop the, the increase in severity? The answer was no, right? So, the, so of course that could be two things. It could be that the amyloid hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease is wrong and you can lock it up till the cows come home and it makes no difference. Or it could be that the drug didn't work. And so we sort of, okay. This has got some tables, don't, don't worry too much. But this is strike two, solanuzumab. Same idea, an antibody designed to lock up the amyloid and have it, um, have it, uh, uh, it, it um, drag it out of the central, out of the brain. And basically what you're looking for down on the, the left-hand column here is P is less than 0.05, the magic scientific statistical significance number. You can see that on the clinical ones, that ADAS-COG-11 or ADAS-COG-14, that was the same instrument that you saw in the last figure. You can see that there was no difference. After 80 weeks of treatment, people had gotten worse by the same amount under placebo or under drug. Strike two. Strike three. 
was this drug, the same drug in a different study. This company ran two studies simultaneously. The important part about this is that it's a substantial investment and it was a, sample, a substantial sample size, right? But a second time, they were able to show, unfortunately, that their drug had no effect. Okay, a crucial part, though, uh, about these studies is it takes a long time to do a clinical trial. So a clinical trial, for example, that I'm just just waxing lyrical here, so roughly, but a clinical trial that's aimed, that will start in, uh, so, so a clinical trial aimed to start in, say, 2018 is in progress now, is in planning now, and a, a clinical trial that began in two, that begins in 2018 probably won't finish until 2020. All right, so the time lag from planning to completion these clinical trials is substantial. So one of the one of our missions, if you like, at the Flory and indeed to the worldwide Alzheimer group is to speed this whole process up. These people began these trials before amyloid imaging was available. And so to get into this trial, a necessary condition wasn't that you were amyloid positive, it was that you had Alzheimer's disease clinically defined. So there's a very real possibility, retrospectively, that all of the people in these trials might not have had the disease, which causes, look, okay, this one's good because it's got a bit of an era of subterfuge about it. This is my photographs of a presentation given by a, a person who worked for a company called Biogen, who was showing the results for the first time of their drug in phase two called aducanumab. And Sorry for the funny angle, but what we're looking at over here is amyloid plaque reduction. So the difference about this study was everybody who came into the study had to undergo an amyloid scan and everyone was positive to get in. And when that was the case, you can see that giving their drug, which is not that dissimilar to bapinuzumab and solanuzumab, at least in as much as that it's aimed at getting amyloid out of the central nervous system, you can see that as, it, as 54 weeks of treatment going down here is better. All right, so the drug was removing amyloid in the blue there. And on this side are the clinical symptoms. And here you want data to go up. All right, so you can see that the, um, oh, sorry, sorry. Here you want data to go to, to remain the same. Right, so you can see that the blue bar there, the yellow bar is placebo, so that would be what would be the normal deterioration in cognitive function. And the blue bar is those people who have got a dose of the drug, and you can see that the cognition has remained stable across the times. So the people haven't declined any further. So here, there's, the drug is taking amyloid out of these brains, and at the same time, there's a, um, the, the disease has stabilised. So this was pretty good news for the community because it actually suggests, I think, that the amyloid hypothesis is at least partially right. Removing amyloid does halt the disease. Might not be the whole story, but it's something. It caused, um, it caused the solanuzumab group to go back and say, well, what about if we just analyse those people in our study that had amyloid, and lo and behold, when they reanalyzed it, now, in science sometimes it's, it's a bit dicky when you go back and reanalyse your data. It's sort of like, you know, re-cooking re the cake a second time. But that being said, and appreciating that you're now biased and unblinded, solanuzumab turned out to be positive that their drug reduced amyloid burden and improved clinical symptoms. Not by much, but certainly operating on this um, uh, had some effect. Another good way to think about the future of treatment is to see what the investors are saying about this. It's probably unusual in a scientific presentation to have a market analysis. But you could imagine that the company that identifies a drug for Alzheimer's disease would be something that would have substantial value. And sometimes market an analysts actually do a pretty good job of cutting through all the crap that we scientists sometimes come out with trying to dress up our things. So they have a bit of a dispassionate look. And largely these are the drugs that are in play at the moment. Aducanumab was that drug I showed you before that was successful. 
Uh, that was in phase two, so now it's moving into phase three. Band 2401 is, a, is, is another drug of the same class by Ezai, a base inhibitor. Crenonuzumab, gatorinuzumab, solonuzumab, and bapinuzumab. They sort of, they've ponuzumab and bapinuzumab failed, stopped. Uh, these uh, other drugs, solonuzumab, a second chance, so they're having a look again with amyloid now known, and we've got the, the um, base inhibitors, aducanumab and band 2401 in practice. So there are drugs under development, and this is a sort of timeline I think that we'll, we'll get. So we'll start to have results 2017 about the success. In fact, the, the uh, the Lilly compound, uh, solonuzumab, that one that I showed you that was initially unsuccessful, where there was a re-evaluation, they began new trials uh, that will read out later this year. For, and, and that might be the first drug that will be approved for Alzheimer's disease by, uh, as a therapy designed to improve the disease by removing amyloid. Probably not going to be the best one ever, but it's starting, which I think gives us Okay, those, the, all of those trials were characterised by an important issue in that they all were began, all took place in people who had dementia. Right? So I said that one of the problems was they might not all have had amyloid in their brain, but they all had dementia. And we know in medicine, sometimes prevention is much easier or much a, a better target than trying to fix up damage once it's done. So if you recall this slide where I suggested to you that we should consider Alzheimer's disease as a slow accumulative process whereby there is accumulation of amyloid and loss of neurons and that is uh, 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 um, associated with a loss of cognition that only at the end becomes so severe that people can no longer uh, um, live independently, why wouldn't you start earlier? especially if we can now detect in people the presence of amyloid even when they're well. And this is the way that it's moving. I've got the brown arrow here to indicate where the solonuzumab and uh, bapinuzumab studies have on the far left. The green arrow, we're starting to see those companies now moving to an earlier stage, that MCI stage of the disease, MCI with amyloid. But why wouldn't you start with the red or the blue arrow? The blue arrow might belong to a class of trials called secondary prevention. That is that if you take someone who is otherwise well but has the pathology, could you intervene at that stage and stop them ever becoming unwell? And then primary prevention, could you even stop, people st stop the disease from beginning at all? Now, in Melbourne, at, at our group, we're a part of this uh, A4 study, uh, the A4 study, the anti-amyloid treatment in asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease. This is a study that's funded by the National Institutes of Health, uh, where entry to the study is the presence of a positive scan, that's it, and cognitive normality. So you're normal cognitively, but you've got the amyloid scan, you actually go in and get access to one of these drugs to test the hypothesis that can we interfere with the disease even before it begins. So our group is the only group in Australia that is doing this. Uh, we, we got 100 slots in this trial. And I think the exciting part of it is that it's showing that from this place down here in the southern hemisphere, tucked away, uh, the expertise that we have in Alzheimer's disease is now allowing us to have access to these early studies as we come. I want to, I want to talk about uh, 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 just this uh, final thing uh, that I think is some really great, I, I, I find one of the most exciting things that's come out of our study. This is data from the ABLE study now, broken into uh, the black line amyloid negative and the uh, blue line amyloid positive. And all these people were cognitively normal when we met them. And you can see they've now been followed over nine years. I've been focusing this whole talk on the blue line, saying, Alzheimer's disease is this, it's a slow degenerative disease, there's all this gunk in your brain, right? But look at the black line, right? That's the thing that astounds me. Largely, I think we've found 
that in the absence of amyloid, there's no such thing as memory, age-related memory loss. That's my, that's my hypothesis I'm going to put here. You know, there's this stuff, oh, I'm getting old, I can't remember, and all that jazz. I don't think it happens. Look at this. These people are 60 through their 90. The idea that there was some normal age-related loss of cognition would be manifest by a deterioration in, in these tests, maybe at a slower rate than those people with disease. Crucial thing about the ABLE study is that it's not an epidemiological study. All these risk factors over here largely get you kicked out of the ABLE study because what we were trying to do was understand the, the pathogenesis of the disease. So we wanted to understand amyloid and tau. We didn't want it to be interrupted by the potential of vascular risk factors and that. It's not an epidemiological study, it's an experimental study, right? So this is a pretty rare group. This is a group of older people who don't have uncontrolled diabetes, don't have stroke, don't have a history of heart disease. They're pretty rare, right? But in the absence of that, there's no age-related cognitive decline. So my, I think the important message here now is that this, this causes us to not live nihilistically about ageing. Given that we have, th that, that Alzheimer's disease, yes, will affect a proportion of us, that's not a substantial, at age 80, it's still only 50%, right? In the absence of these other risk factors, there's no change. So it has two things, I think. It means that we should all look forward, in the absence of disease, to good cognitive health. It probably means that 40 to 60 year olds need to behave themselves much better than they may have in the past, because you really got to plan for the future here. Medically, it's crucial because it means that your doctor should never send you home saying this person's got some cognitive change, it's just age-related cognitive change. I don't believe that for a second. There is cognitive change in ageing, but it doesn't, or I don't believe at the moment, that it reflects normal ageing. It probably reflects some sort of pathology that you probably can do something about. So another important message that I think is coming out of these studies is that there's a huge upside to healthy living and healthy ageing. And I'm going to finish there. Thank you very much.